Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe Show and Tell. This week we're going to talk about storyboards. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. I'm Tom Scholey. Storyboards and comics, a lot of, lot of uh, very similar. If you're not sure what you're looking at, I think there's a lot of common ground between the two. Often we see cartoonists that get into storyboarding. Sometimes they do both. Uh, Gabriel Hardman is a guy I think of. He starts out in comics in the late 90s. He's kind of unhappy. Goes on to storyboard with guys like Christopher Nolan, uh, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, some of these big projects, and then comes and goes between comics and storyboards. So I think there's a lot of, from a cartoonist and making point of view, a lot that we can take from storyboarding. Um, I view it almost as a draft, right? Sure. In the case of a movie, you're taking a very big budget project and for much lesser money, planning it out and really getting a detailed idea of like, will it work, how will it work, and what will we need to do to, to make this? You know, where does the budget go? And I think from a cartoonist standpoint, we can get things from uh, storytelling practices of film, you know, things like cinematography, spatial definition is, I think, something that's emphasized more in film, so we'll see that in storyboards. So this week I thought we would just look at some of the storyboard stuff that has been published that, you know, is relatively easy to access, and in some cases by some artists that we admire and enjoy. Yeah, I look forward to it, man. I have a couple storyboard books myself, and there are certain things that I've discovered online. Like, I'll make a controversial statement right here. Um, the best storytelling in a Stephen Platt comic ever is the storyboards he did for the Iron Man movie. You can actually read it and tell what the hell's yes. going on there. There are a lot of great resources online for storyboards. There's some of, like, the Coen Brothers uh, storyboard artists, and then, you know, like, shot-by-shot -shot comparisons. I'm a big fan of their compositions and things, so it's interesting to see those kinds of resources, and they are relatively easy to find online now. So, yeah, this is just kind of a, a primer for some things to look at and, and maybe to consider in the uh, adjacent to comics scene. Should we go put some of this stuff under the microscope, Jim? Let's do it. Movie Storyboards, The Art of Visualizing Screenplays. This is a collection of several storyboard examples from different artists, different movies and stuff. So we'll look at a couple of the uh, what they have included. And I thought we would start with the famous shower scene from Psycho. Classic. Storyboarded by renowned designer Saul Bass. I mentioned in the intro, you do this as a way to generate drafts, to work through ideas. And I think this is probably one of the best examples of that. Something that's quite a film challenge. You know, how do you depict this thing? Uh, being able to have sketches made, I think, is, is a great first step. And I think that's something a lot of cartoonists do you know, when they're working out scenes. Like, some cartoonists, I think, write that way. I'm in the midst of it right now, man, where I've discovered there's an eight-page sequence that just isn't quite working for me. Thankfully, I was able to figure that out in a stage where it took me, like, you know, an hour per page as opposed to 13 hours per page. Right. That's the other part, right, that storyboarding or, or sketching does is uh, easy to generate multiple drafts. Um, you know, you can see these are drawn relatively fast, very sketchy and rough at this stage. Another highlight in this book is from Apocalypse Now storyboards. For some reason, these remind me of Bill Sienkiewicz, but I love that they're in color. I think they're drawn with pens in mm -hmm. some cases. Widescreen format. Very widescreen. Makes me think of James Stokey. Yeah, that's another, an, another one. Just super detailed art. You know, I just mentioned about them being sketches and you can generate them quickly and stuff, but like these are very developed. And I bet these guys still generated them pretty fast, man. Yeah. Like they're like once you once you develop that tool set, man, it's it's in there to stay. But the I mean that's pretty stunning on its own. That would work as a two page spread in any comic yeah, like, like yeah, I exactly. want to read. Like why wouldn't you draw a comic like this? Like that that's that's a cool thing as a creator looking at these is you see all these different ways that you can depict action graphically that, that you haven't seen in a comic. So it's, it's just like a bigger toolbox to draw from. Yeah, I think from that point of view, like as a reference, these are really effective because it is the same problem that cartoonists have. Where's the point of view in this, in this panel? And you see like a very realistic, you know, solution to those problems in storyboarding because ultimately this is a setup for a camera guy, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely influences that we could be borrowing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many comic shots that are just like the straight on level kind of shot. It's, uh, it's nice to consider a different point of view. One of my favorite examples in this book is Martin Scorsese. This is from Raging Bull. And he talks about the value of doing this. You know, these are his drawings. So yeah. very, very crude, very rough. But when he was trying to figure out the boxing scenes in Raging Bull, 
he was doing things that hadn't been done on film before. So like he had to have some idea of like, where's this camera need to be for me to get these shots or to make this boxing scene work a certain way. And you know, it's just enough information to say it's one person in this shot or it's a close up here or there. Uh, you know, camera's got to be in the ring, etc. cetera. Um, but the information that he needs, like we talk a lot about production art. These are totally production art. You know, this is, mm -hmm. this is absolutely like information graphics of how to actually film this thing and set it up. This looks like a Frank Santoro comic. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And another example of different media, you know, like those, those previous examples, we've seen pen and ink and color, uh, probably watercolor, I imagine, on Apocalypse Now. Now we're seeing like just crude pencil drawings with a little bit of indication of blood. Possibly a ballpoint pen doing the blood there. If kayfabers have stuck around for our weekly shoots, they know that I'm a de devotee of these master classes. And there is a Martin Scorsese master class, and he was talking about like how his love of film, you know, his, his entire life, when he was a kid, asthma, all that, went to go see, I don't know, Spartacus or something in the 50s and ran home, didn't have access to a camera, didn't have access to costumes or 10,000 people to get his vision across. So he basically made the movie on paper. They show off examples of these storyboards he calls them uh on the master class but they are it's wordless comics yeah he could have had a big career <laughs> Those, is that uh, Starenko? yeah that looks like something Starenko was into if he didn't yeah do it it's not it's not yeah i mean because this looks like his like sherlock holmes or something yeah i mean he did he did do those initial raiders pictures mm -hmm. but yeah nothing i'm always impressed with the color mock-ups mm -hmm. it just feels like it, it defies that quick sketch part that, you know, we talk about. I like the little stuff, too, the indicators of, like, zoom-ins and mm -hmm. camera motion and things like that. You start to see a little bit of that creeping into the vocabulary of comics. I've seen, like, some people, you know, Dash use that Shaw kind of would stuff. do little things mm -hmm. like that, I think. Yeah, often I, I would see it in, like, Golden Age layouts where it wasn't clear where the next <laughs> right. panel was, so oh, the right, arrows right, were right. there to be like, read this one next. I, I, I think the, the cartoonists who do work in both... Uh, uh, disciplines do kind of take stuff back and forth that that enriches the work. There's a movie favorite, right? The Crow. This don't look like James O'Barr, <laughs> but it it does look like uh, '80s black and white boom. It, it looks like Outlaw Comics. Yeah. It does. That's a great panel for Outlaw <laughs> this, Comics. This stuff here. This book's pretty cool. Like it has Salvador Dali uh, artwork in it. it. You know, it has stuff going back to Orson Welles movies. So it's a pretty broad sample of. That's beautiful. You know, different approaches, different eras, and uh, and we'll get into some more of those. Like, there are some Star Wars in here, but I think we'll look at that in a separate book that's dedicated just to the Star Wars. Um, sometimes I think you can see, like, they're looking for different information. Like, to me, this is about light and yeah. light source and uh -huh. management. Um, beautiful and drawings, but, uh, you know, that's, I think, the information they're, they're providing there for the filmmaker. So these are some of the Salvador Dali pieces. They're almost more concept art, I think, maybe, than uh, storyboards. But whoever put this book together, I guess, had access to it, so you're not going to cut Salvador Dali. <laughs> this is oh, very yeah. Ditko. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I yeah, this is totally Ditko. I was just listening to a podcast where, uh, talking about Salvador Dali pitched the Marx Brothers a movie that ended up not being made, but they just made like a graphic novel uh, of like what it might have been. Oh, wow. Using his art? Uh, no, but they tried to, like, recreate, like, the thing. Because there wasn't too much art or anything. There was basically just, like, a treatment. Sounds like a way to get his name on a book. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. The Art of the Matrix. Um, obviously, whenever The Matrix came out, you know, super popular movie. So they published this book. It features two prominent cartoonists, Jeff Darrow and Steve Scrochi. And the interesting story with those guys, they storyboarded this movie before the movie was greenlit because there were so many cutting edge effects and things that were planned for this movie and a relatively big budget for relatively unknown filmmakers they had to really convince the studios of their vision and so um they the wachowskis had worked with steve scrochi at marvel on razor line the uh, clive barker universe and i guess maintained a friendship and a working relationship and so they would commission him to do pieces of this as they were going through like the production process of just getting money and getting you know producers on board so this is steve scrochi art here some of the sequences are very similar to what ultimately made it into the film some change quite a bit some are cut altogether and there are extensive notes throughout talking about you know how these scenes were used changed um how the working process went you know they would often get together for 
kind of like small, I, I don't know if they had like a chunk of money or to do like X amount of scenes, but they would get together for a few days, go over some stuff, make these scenes, and then go to the next round of like trying to get this thing greenlit. And it's pretty detailed, you know, this is the entire story is, is in here. And then these are some Jeff Darrow uh, storyboards, a very iconic scene, uh, Neo and Agent Smith in the subway, shooting it out, fighting it out. Kind of neat to see Jeff Darrow, a guy who's very detailed and tight artwork in a more... Going a little bit loose. Yes, a little bit loose, but By his also standards. in his pencils. It, it's got to be that he's tracing these to clean them up, I assume, because they're still very, very detailed and, and very clean. Talk about the relationship between storyboards and comics. It's like we got, you know, uh, legit comics artists, you know, doing the storyboards for a movie, and then the the success of the movie finances uh, more comics. Like the Wachowski started their their comics line that all these guys had had books on. Yeah, it's a good point. And and Matrix comics as well. I can remember one free comic book day. I think Dave Lapham had a Matrix comic that came out, um, obviously connected. Yeah, once the Wachowskis discovered how cheap car- cartoonists can be draw, their, draw their pages, man. Like, oh yeah, man, we got these guys for 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 nothing, man, to do. Th- think about sequences. historically what was going on in comics at this time. It was a bleak. T- this is around the time like me and you started, Jim. This is like yeah, a real bleak sure. era. This is neat. This is the uh, the big sequence whenever they go and, and rescue um, Lawrence Fishburne, and it's the helicopter sequence. And so there's some changes between the storyboards and the movie. But this is one of those like giant budgets, like how do you crash a helicopter in the middle of a busy street? And it's beautiful. The drawings, though, you know, like mm-hmm. like the re- the helicopter, the reflection in the buildings. It's a lot of drawing. These you can find, too. I think they printed a million of these books. You can find them at, like, half-price books and places. Yeah, I'll be getting one once we get off this uh, recorded session. This is one of the more interesting, um, like, production script books that I found. So this is not traditional storyboarding. They call these color scripts. And this is something Pixar, I guess, maybe pioneered. I don't know if it's related to the production process of 3D that you you need to map this stuff out or it's maybe much, much cheaper to map it out ahead of time. But these are incredible. So they would build very detailed color, you know, like they call them color scripts, but they're, they're almost storyboards. And it was to establish pretty much the mood of the scenes uh, to get that palette worked out, I guess, ahead of time. And they did it, you know, in their early works and apparently liked the results, so they carry through. This book features, I don't know, maybe their first 10 movies or something. And it's nice how it's arranged because you actually get to see those color shifts happen. You know, it's over the course of several scenes uh, are visible in one of these pages. Pretty quick drawings, you know, probably working from an early story script, I guess. And I think it's a practice that has now been adopted much more widely, in uh, at least in the animation industry. It's almost like looking at a palette. Exactly, yeah. Again, going back to like our use for this stuff, mm-hmm. making comics, I think we all build color palettes, and that's part of that process is like trying to figure out what fits, you know, this whatever particular story we're working on. Like getting the color palette figured out early on is an important part of that. So this is kind of right up my alley for that. This is an incredible book here. Yeah. And we have, once again, we have cartoonist friends who work at Pixar, like like Scott Morse. You know, he, he, he might have done a couple of these things. The Incredibles. You see a different set of media, you know, like now they're just drawing them digitally, but same deal. It's, it's very distinct. I like to think of this, um, you know, like I'm a big proponent of making your scenes very distinct. Yeah. And color is one of those areas that's sure. a pretty clear way to communicate that. And you see it on display here. This is like that artist Shag or Bob mm-hmm. Steak with two A's. Makes sense, you know, for all the modern, that modern style. Of and they ended up using that incredible. approach mm-hmm. in, in the credit sequence and stuff. The, oh, the animations, they? yeah. At least in the second one. I don't, I don't remember the first one. I love it whenever you can see, like, the mood dipping <laughs> in the color. It's pretty good. Good book. Yeah, that's, that's a different one. I'm, I'm very happy that, to have found this one. So these are a little different. This is Mobius Comics. These feature uh, a few different Mobius stories and some information, but they also have a series of storyboards that he did for something called Internal Transfer. I don't know that this was ever produced, but it's a chance to see Mobius approaching you know, that filmic language. 
And this runs through all six issues. This is a caliber comic from the, from the 80s, I think. And we know Mobius had, had uh, his dances with feature films uh, many times, man. I, I recommend everybody take a look at the Joe Dorowski's Dune documentary. It's about a flick that never got made, man. I, I show it to all my creative friends, man, because the, the, the idea that you take away from that is, uh, even if a project fails, some fun stuff could still come out of that union. Yeah, that's the best example, uh, probably, to find some of his, some of his production work. You know, this isn't the greatest. We're talking about production, and so this isn't the greatest way to show. You know, the printing and whatever, but it does show you that that you know, in a lot of cases, you can take storyboards and and just repurpose them for print and and you know, Making where's comics. the problem? Yeah, they're comics. It reminds me a lot of something like Stray Bullets. Yeah, David Lapham's crime comic that uses the eight-panel grid, and it's you know like that's a, a comic and an artist that's influenced obviously by film and kind of comes across in his storytelling. This is the Batman animated book that Paul Dini and Chip Kidd put together. This is one of my favorite books, just in general. Mm -hmm. Classic. One of their uh, one of the cool pieces in here is storyboards from the opening sequence of the cartoon, and it's it's. You know, like these are the complete storyboards, so it's really interesting to kind of go through there. I feel like that's one of those great iconic treatments of Batman. And again, you get to see some of the uh, some of the film techniques, right? Like the pans and, and zooms as you watch. But man, incredible economy of drawing. You know, these simple shapes just in silhouette that read perfectly. And, you know, Bruce Tim doing the storyboards here. So this is a, a book of Star, Star Wars storyboards, and um, it's uh, I'm, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, uh, but like I'm always interested in, in, you know, when you're trying to figure out this thing that no one's ever seen before, like what is Star Wars? You know, even George Lucas didn't really know quite what it was. So, so you see these like approaches to uh, the world and the characters that are like very different than what we ended up with. Like, like one of the things I took from this book was just seeing like how well pencil how well you can tell a story like purely in 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 pencil and some like i i work entirely in pencil now so this artist might have been the one who did the apocalypse now or i mm. like like this name i was floating around in the other books we just looked at so yeah and this is like the the um like he didn't come from a storyboarding uh background i think his name's pronounced tu tuvalaris um so th i mean you don't really see storyboards that look like this like it, like as this volume goes on they start to get that that format, which is kind of like the Joe Johnston format, um, and, and this kind of becomes like what they look like from from here on out. I love these drawings; like they're done in marker, uh, you know, a fine liner type marker for the line work, and then those bigger, almost probably equivalent of a Copic marker or something today for some of the the shading. I find these very attractive, though, and it you know there are like what we call silent comics or wordless comics where the storytelling is all done without the benefit of any words. And like you say, Tom, this is kind of a very similar <laughs> approach to storytelling. Since since the, the markers are non-archival, I like the way the colors have sort of transferred. They've gone from like gray images to kind of brown, red. You got C-3PO with like a ball gag. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out what the Millennium Falcon's going to be. And then uh, Joe Johnston, who did a lot of these, he ended up becoming a movie director, directed The Rocketeer, uh, the first Captain America movie. This stuff looks so great. Like, all mm -hmm. the space stuff in the in the spaceships, it feels like this was essential for Lucas trying to figure out, like, how do we film this stuff to capture that grandeur and, and the size and scale of outer space? And it feels like these things... You, you wouldn't have Star Wars without this kind of for sure. building. And, and like you were saying about The Matrix... It's like he's trying to convince his uh, these uh, executives of his vision and trying really hard and, and, and failing in a lot of cases. So how else are you going to do it? Boy, these are nice drawings. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned Frank Santoro before. Like This feels a, a lot like some of his marker work. This is one of my favorite storyboard books. I always get this out of the library. Um, yeah, I broke down and just bought it yeah. one day. <laughs> if you're a Star Wars fan, like there's a lot of meat on this bone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of a shame. Like once they do figure out what Star Wars is, because as it goes on, it gets less interesting because it, it becomes just like you know reiterating established things. But like the first third of this book is is a lot of fun. 
That's funny. Yeah, once you start to establish the characters, like, you know, Howard Chaykin did it better in the comic. <laughs> okay, little Yoda. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, you get a sense with these that they are even drafts. Like, there mm -hmm. are probably several drafts of a lot of these sequences. Uh, you yeah, know, a, bunch of, a bunch of guys working simultaneously on the same sequence. Take, take a look at any of the DVD extras, like even for the uh, Attack of the Clones uh, prequel DVD, and you just see like these guys doing their versions of Yoda. And we already know what Yoda looks like, but George Lucas has got his hammer over top of these guys' heads, man. You see that they were bleary-eyed, probably stayed up two nights, man. And it still wasn't good enough for them. For, um... We have a lot of friends in comics who do storyboards, maybe on the side. And I always hear those stories like from people that did Adventure Time storyboards, where it's like, once you're on, it's like round the clock you know, to produce mm -hmm. that episode. So I'm sure the guys who were doing Star Wars had the same, the same deal. Probably especially so if you have low budgets, everybody's stressed trying to you know, make that dollar look like $10. I'm sure this is uh, one of those stages where guys are really pushing. I, I try to think of that like animation and film work ethic, you know, when I'm working, because it's like, you know, in com you, you, don't, you can't complain because there's people who have it worse. So this is a good one. Probably good for, for cartoonists, good for Star Wars fans. I think that's one of the nicer uh, extra art books, you mm -hmm. know, and, and probably Star Wars, one of the, the uh, pioneers of publishing all that kind of art. And then finally, I'm going to end on some anime storyboards. This is Paprika, and it's pretty straightforward. I, I guess this has become a, a somewhat popular subgenre, so you'll see a lot of, well, not a lot, but certainly a few of these collections of storyboards from popular anime yeah, they, being published. They exist for every Studio Ghibli movie. Yeah. So you get to see all of uh, Miyazaki making those decisions. Tech and King Crete, although I don't think these are drawn by Matsumoto. Some of them kind of look like it. And it varies a lot from scene to scene. You know, some of the stuff is much more clear. And this is another example of like seeing what are they actually working out? You know, sometimes it's just a couple of characters walking around. And so that's all you're really seeing uh, as opposed to full on drawing. You know, it's basically the animated parts and right. yeah, what they, they need to make that scene work. Yeah, they establish the background. So then all you need is like the character movement after that point. I enjoy looking through these, though. Again, it's another... Another way to approach storytelling visually. I like to keep uh, these kind of storytelling, these storyboard books uh, close whenever I'm pacing out my own stories, man. Just to kind of like, just have some extra examples at hand for different camera compositions or whatever. To me, these are the best that I've seen of the of the anime storyboards, probably because Otomo, you know, famously drew these. So it's really a chance to see a master at work, and also. Uh, a subsequent draft in a lot of ways you know after drawing the manga first this is a chance for him to maybe go through streamline cleanup you know where the manga becomes a draft mm -hmm. that precedes the the storyboards it's all about the work i don't know why these aren't more widely available they'll set you back if you track down a copy on ebay these days yeah or just go go to korea <laughs> just go to Korea, man. It's cover price out there. <laughs> I looked in every manga shop I visited in Tokyo and couldn't find them anywhere in Japan. I'm, but, I'm surprised. Uh, Korea might be the, the missing ingredient there. I was real nervous, man, because I had to use my card. I didn't have, like, Korean money. And I was like, I was like you know what? I'm just going to do it because I know these things are, like, 200 bucks a piece back home. So if this $30 thing uh, ends up being, like, all the surcharges... A hundred dollars, I'll live with it. The surcharge, the extra fees from you know transferring U.S. to to Korean, it's like three dollars or something. Man. Oh man, yeah. should, you should have brought a suitcase of these things back. Could have been a side business. It crossed my mind, man. <laughs> it crossed my mind. I love the design on these too. I just think they're beautiful. Have you sat down and like tried to read these like as comics? Because it does. It, it works. Yeah, it, it you and you get into almost like a trance. You know, it kind of yeah it's another type of reading experience. That's something I always think with the grid, like anything that's gridded after you read a couple of pages, pretty soon it falls away. Like, you, you know, the same size panels, it just becomes the content of the panels, which is what you're going to get in, you know, in a, in, a, mm -hmm. in a reading experience like this. And that's a great effect. Like, that's totally an effect I'm aware of in comics. Yeah. The cool thing about um, these storyboards is that you could see the amount of seconds and milliseconds that 
will go into everything you see on the page. So um, as the camera pans or whatever, Otomo's making those decisions. And if you see, I forget what the Ghibli documentary is called, but you see Miyazaki sitting there with his storyboards and he has a stopwatch in hand and he looks at his storyboards and closes his eyes and clicks to stopwatch and takes a look at it and starts to like yeah. fill in those times. So he's like, you know, trying to see the movie in his mind. Yeah, the timing component is a whole nother thing that, you know, it's pretty different than making comics. Right. There's some awareness of timing, but nothing that precise. Uh, way outside of our pay grade. Like, I can't imagine yeah. pacing uh, a, a film. That's just a whole different discipline. So that's some examples of storyboards that, that I have enjoyed looking through. We always try to leave K Fabers with something to look up. I would say this is an easy book to find. You know, it's in print, relatively inexpensive, and features a very broad survey of storyboards. The Star Wars uh, storyboards are another item that's uh, pretty readily available and, and one that might appeal to viewers. This has me juiced up, man. I'm in the middle of like pacing out and doing my first draft of my next comic, man. So I feel like we should get back to business, man. What do you say about that? Let's do it. So, K Favors, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon if you haven't done so already. It'll notify you whenever we have new videos available. We usually put up uh, at least two a week. You can support us through merch at our spread shop. You can find a link below the video. We're going to get back to making our comics, but you K Favors know what your marching orders are. Read more comics. <laughs>